All right. Thank you uh, for the lovely introduction and thank you all for tuning in to me. Um, I hope I can give you some more interesting insights in mobile application security. But before we dive into the deep end, I would like to tell you a story. And our story starts with Axel. Axel is a senior Android developer at a completely fictional company named Run for Roses. And Run for Roses is a flower delivery app. It's a Friday afternoon. Axel was just about to go home, and his product manager quickly asks him, can you just before the weekend implement this one simple feature? Um, we have an upcoming collaboration with another app called Wedding Planner, and they want that um, they can easily order roses from within their Wedding Planner app. So our apps would need to have some kind of communication mechanism. Axel thinks about this and thinks, oh, I can quickly make this work. Um, so what actually happens is you have the Rent for Roses app, you have the Wedding Planner app, and there can be some kind of communication mechanism. Android supports that, and that is intense. So um, Axel starts and writes this kind of intent handler. So the wedding planner can send an intent, and the intent handler can then send um, start to write activity within the Rent for Roses app. So it's even extendable to all kinds of um, uh, activities within the Rent for Roses app. So it seems like a very easy and good solution, um, implements it, pushes to production, everything works, everybody's happy, and uh, everybody goes to their weekend. And then we meet our second person in the story. It's Slash. It's a board student. He uh, lives in his mother's basement. And what do they do? Well, they love to break stuff. And Slash hears his mother raving about this big new wedding app. And Slash decides to take a look. And the next morning in the newspaper, we find the following sentence. Breaking news, thanks for the flowers. Popular de flower delivery app, Run for Roses, racking up users' phone bill. So somewhere, something went wrong and the whole Run for Roses app was broken, probably by this last minute feature. And this sounds very disconnected, but stuff like this happens a lot in the real world as well where some random thing turns out to be a very, very big security problem. And it's usually not even a very, uh, not even security researchers coming on, on this. It's usually people like Slash who break a lot of this stuff. So you could be saying that Slash has quite an appetite for destruction. So in the coming half an hour, I want you to take I want to take you through a few scenarios where steps like this happen and what the industry and more importantly, what you yourself can do to prevent these scenarios from affecting your own apps. So um, let's get started. And I want to welcome you to this jungle that is mobile application security. And why me? Well, I'm a team lead at GuardSquare, and at GuardSquare, it's our mission to make mobile applications more safe. So we are specializing in mobile security. And you might know us already from our existing products. You might know uh, ProGuard. ProGuard is not a security product, but it is an optimization and shrinking product. And it makes apps faster and smaller. But more importantly, we have our flagship products, DexGuard and XGuard. And uh, DexGuard is obfuscation. Uh, and for Android, XGuard is the same for iOS. And they're code hardening tools. They're meant to make your app harder to understand for a reverse engineer um, and to protect your own IP. Now, um, Thinking back to our Run for Roses story, um, Run for Roses clearly had some kind of security flaw. Um, 
And so then often people come to us thinking, okay, uh, it's a security problem, we come to Guard Square, and we'll use Dex Guard to protect our app better. Um, so they apply code hardening to their app. And uh, is it a good idea? Yes. Will it slow down people like Slash? Yes. But I don't think it's the right approach to use code hardening to prevent security issues from occurring. Hiding security flaws behind code hardening, I'd like to compare that with hiding an elephant behind a tree. You make it harder to find the elephant, but that's not really the point. You should remove the elephant from your app altogether, not try to hide it. So code hardening is not the answer here. And um, so you might be thinking, what is the answer then? Um, better code reviews. This wouldn't happen at my company because we do good code reviews. And then also, I have bad news for you because it happens all the time with very big applications. For instance, there's uh, in the last couple of years been intent abuse on Samsung Flow. There's been own clouds um, that made it possible to steal any protected files on Android. There were multiple bugs leading to remote code execution on TikTok. There was a two-factor authentication bypass on Grab. There were issues on Twitter, on Dropbox, on New Relic, on Coinbase, so probably in your app as well. So we need to look at something else. And people like Slash are the worst because they make it seem so easy. So let's take a deeper look at what their approach is. So what does an attacker look at when they approach a new app? Well, um, there's a very easy answer to that question, and it is everything. But that's probably also not detailed enough. You're looking for something deeper. So let me try to list what is happening, and then I get to an endless list. There's um, code execution through user supplies uh, input. There's wrong host name verifiers. There's signing with uh, debug keys, which provides extra capabilities. There's unprotected native code. The, li the list is quite endless. So there is a more structured approach to how these attackers go about finding all these possible vulnerabilities. So what does a uh, reverse engineer do when he's trying to, to find mobile app vulnerabilities? Well, the first step he could take is doing a static analysis of the APK. So what does that mean? It means taking your APK from the Play Store, it's pretty straightforward to download APKs, and putting it in some kind of analysis tool. Uh, an easy one is a decompiler called JDEX. It's open source, it's on GitHub. I recommend you have a look if you don't know it. And JDEX is able to recover quite a bit of your code structure just from the APK itself. It produces quite readable Java code that's pretty close to an original source code. And you can look at that code and try to find mistakes in um, what is happening there. Or you could look at the network communication. Um, in most apps, it's pretty easy to man in the middle even HTTPS uh, network communication. And it's usually a good entry point in understanding what is going on inside of your app. Or you could consider app-to-app -app communication, um, where this is, uh, this is where Run for Roses probably had an issue, because it wasn't a communication between two apps. It's usually a very interesting entry point inside of your application. Now, in the case of Slash, he didn't even need stuff like dynamic analysis. He could just get by by using static analysis. So Slash took the batting pan wrap, he put it into JDEX, and after some scrolling, he could find the following piece of code. He saw there was an intent being sent to the Roses for Weddings app from within the Wedding Planner app. And so this new intent contained a string extra, which referred to the right like, activity that was in the Roses, um, Run for Roses app. And then the intent was sent to the Android system. Now, um, you see intent communication. So I was thinking, what does it actually mean? So somehow the Rent for Roses app is registering to the Android system for events and then being notified whenever that event occurs. Okay. 
And then there's this one mantra that's always in the head of somebody trying to reverse engineer an app. It's how can I abuse this system? And after thinking uh, about this, there's an, an interesting way to try to abuse this, and that's by maliciously crafting some kind of event. Okay, so um, to know what kind of crafting you would need to do, then we need to know more about this intent handler. So just do the same again on the Inferoses app itself. We put it in JDEX, we try to understand what is going on, and then we get to this piece of code. It's a string extra class name. So somehow, um, this string extra then gets directly called in class for name. So we're doing reflection directly from um, code inside of an intent. So that's something we can probably abuse and get access to classes which we shouldn't have an access to. And this might seem far-fetched, but let me bring you to a real-world example. Uh, but first, let me explain um, the connection again. Um, so the, sent, the intent was sent to the Rent for Roses app, and um, Axel, the original developer, thought it just pointed to Roses for Weddings and Roses for Funerals, but Slash found a way to abuse this intent and find connections to a make calls thingy. So there was an unintended link because there was some kind of insecure reflection going on. And this kind of stuff is real. So let me take you to the real world example, Samsung Flow. And Samsung Flow is a app that is meant to, uh, that makes it available for you to remotely do most functionality on your phone. Um, so you can control your phone from your computer. So you can imagine it needs quite a bit of permissions to be able to accommodate that. And that's exactly why issues in security in an app like Samsung Flow usually have big consequences. So if we have a look at uh, a Samsung Flow version from about a year ago, and we put it in JDEX, we would find the following piece of code. There's a bit of extra fluff in there, but the things you need to pay attention to are the following. You see intent gets string extra class name, and then a Samsung Flow uh, class for name string extra. So this exact same vulnerability I just explained was present in the real world app as well. We were not the ones finding this vulnerability, but I wanted to show you this is real world stuff. Um, the CVE number is on the top right. So it's a publicly known thing from around last February. And using this, uh, uh, by abusing this, people were able to do a lot of things just by having Samsung Flow installed on the same device. So for instance, this would be a piece of code that would allow you to call any arbitrary phone number from any app, um, even without any calling permissions, if you had Samsung Flow installed on the same device. So it's just by putting some extra information inside of a intent. And it's can lead to even worse things than that. So a small mistake can have big consequences. So you could call arbitrary phone numbers, but you, I can one-up you by just factory resetting your whole phone. Samsung Flow had the permissions to do that, so you just could, in, could factory reset a phone from any random app on your phone if you had Samsung Flow installed. Or you can install arbitrary apps and uninstall arbitrary apps. So imagine some random app being able to replace your banking app by a malicious one. So there's definitely consequences to such a small mistake in handling intents. And of course, we are out to get them. So the industry is out to get them. And if I have to summarize what the industry is doing, it's mostly creating acronyms. Although I have to admit, admit that these acronyms are pretty effective. The end result, though, is that the following sentence only makes sense if you're quite an expert at mobile application security. The ADA requires compliance to the MASVS L1 standard developed by OWASP to get a MASA badge. It is recommended to use the MASTG during testing. I don't know about you guys, but this kind of cryptic language wouldn't fly if I added this to my code base. 
but somehow it flies in mobile application security. So I'm going to try to pack it out for you and, and I give you some more insights in what this all means. It all starts from OWASP. OWASP is short for the Open Web Application Security Project. And it's a project that is, has the aim to uh, describe security issues and security protocols for a lot of different um, aspects of the world. And one of them is mobile application security. And these guys publish something called the MASVS. It's short for the Mobile Application Security Verification Standard. It's a book and it's all open source and free on GitHub. And you can read up in the MASVS about all kinds of requirements that your app should adhere to if you want to be secure. So um, it's divided in multiple parts. And so the first part is the MASPS L1. These are the basics for everybody. So if you publish any app on uh, the internet, you should probably adhere to this MASPS L1 um, requirements. An example here would be security controls are never enforced only on the client side, but on the respective remote endpoints. Seems to me like a very sensible thing for any app ever. But of course, not all apps are created equally. Some handle more sensitive data than others. And I expect more from my banking app or a medical app than I expect from my to-do list. So for those cases, there is the MASVS L2, the level two. They provide additional defense in depth controls that should, you should adhere to if you're handling sensitive data. An example of this would be remote endpoints verify that connecting clients use an up-to-date version of the mobile app. I think it's a good idea if you um, have sensitive data that you require your users to always have the latest security updates of your app. Um, it doesn't end there. The, the next step is MASPSR, short for resilience, and it's all about preventing reverse engineering. This is explicitly not a third level because preventing reverse engineering has a different target audience than the L2. The resilience part is more interesting for people who want to protect their IP. Imagine you're a gaming company and you want to prevent cheats. You don't really handle sensitive data, so the L2 isn't very relevant for you, but you want to prevent cheats, so preventing reverse engineering for cheat development is important to you. So you see there's different combinations possible. If you're a bank, you probably have sensitive data and you care about your IP. So then I would recommend you have adherence to all three of these um, sections. An example of resilience um, criterion would be the app detects the presence of widely used reverse engineering tools such as code injection tools, hooking frameworks, and debugging servers. It's a good idea because all these tools enable you to really understand what is going on inside of the app and potentially um, make a cheat for a game. So now we have a book telling you rules that you adhere, we should adhere to. But these rules are often relatively vague and hard to know how you would turn them into a real-life application. And luckily, there's an answer to the question, how should we ensure this? And that is, use another book from OWASP. It's called the MASDG. It's the Mobile Application Security Testing Guide. So this testing guide basically explains you in more detail how you can test for certain uh, requirements. So are we done? No, because there's probably not everybody wants to really go digging into this. So there is a ADA, short for App Defense Alliance, that um, is a uh, collaboration in the industry that is accrediting labs to perform an MASA, a Mobile Application Security Assessment. Um, and so these labs have the official permission to do this assessment to see whether apps are actually um, adhering to these um, MASTG and MASVS um, requirements. So in short, we have the MASVS the criteria, the MASTG how to test for the criteria, and then we have the authorized labs giving you um, an uh, inside and then, and then batch if you do your job properly. Okay, so are we done then? 
Well, I didn't really talk about another important question. Does it actually do anything? Would it have prevented any real world attacks? Because basically we have a bunch of documents. Be safe. Well, let's run back to our Run for Roses app. And let's skim through the MESTG and we might cross the following sentence. All inputs from external sources and the user are validated and if necessary, sanitized. This includes data received via the UI, IPC mechanisms such as intents, custom URLs and network sources. So here we are right at the money because we had an unsanitized input to, uh, from, an, from an intent directly used inside our app. So we can see that the Run for Roses vulnerability would have been prevented. Also, the Samsung vulnerability would have been prevented if they adhered to this rule from the MASTG. So this MASTG, that's all we need to do. We're all safe if we just read this thing. And then you quickly encounter the next problem. It's 732 pages. And that's just the latest version. I'm sure that the next one will be even bigger. So by the time you've read through all of this and applied all of the advice, then your app is probably being outdated. So we're definitely not in Paradise City yet. So we need to do more. And that is where GuardScript comes back in again. So we had our existing product portfolio and we saw a missing gap. And if you see a missing gap, we try to fill it. And this time we fill it with AppSweep. AppSweep um, is basically an automated version of this MESTG. You just upload your app and you get feedback in terms of what um, criteria of the MESTG you're not adhering to. Of course, it's not a full-blown replacement to a manual pen test. And that's not what our, what our mission is, but it's a very good first start to make a first test of your app. So does AppSuite cover our Run for Roses app? Of course, it's imaginary. I can easily wrap up something. So let's just dump the vulnerable uh, Samsung Flow app in there. And then we can easily find this piece of information. So you can see here that external data from string intent get string extra is used for code ex execution via intent context class. So we immediately identify the issue as a high severity problem. We refer to the MAS MSTG, um, MASTG finding. We refer to the place in your code and we can explain you how the data flows inside of your um, APK. So actually, we can find real-world problems which have affected real-world apps. And we try to make it actionable and usable, whatever we find. And we also try to make it usable for you to make it as easy as possible for you to use AppSweep. So it's not just drag and drop. We can also integrate in your, into your build system, into your DevOps system. So we support GitHub Actions. We support Gradle, we support Bitrise. We, may, we want to make it as easy as possible for you to be more safe. And we want to do this actually as guard square. We want to do this along the whole life cycle of your application. So it starts when you build your application. Then you, if you have sensitive IP, you probably uh, need to obfuscate your application at that point. You need to use your code hardening tools like DexGuard or XGuard. And at that point, uh, you can get a protection report back from us, telling you what you protected, what you will not protect it against yet, how you can improve. After you've built your application, you need to test your application. And that is where AppSweep comes in, and it gives you a vulnerability testing of your application. But security doesn't stop when you ship your application. Also, when your application is deployed, you want to monitor what is going on with your application in the field. So the chat class, you can see every time somebody tries to attach a hooker or the debugger uh, to your uh, application. Chat class is also an extension of our DexGuard products. So we really try to be with you along the whole way of your software lifecycle. So, I've talked a lot about it, but let's have a quick look at how AppSweep looks if you would use it. So, if you, uh, I'm going to use a uh, 
purposefully insecure and vulnerable Android application to not shame anybody too much. So um, you see, we've uploaded a few different builds from this app. And you can see the trend lines of what findings we have, how many findings we have. Because security is not a thing you do once. Security is a thing you need to keep monitoring and you want to see changes over time. So let's have a deeper look at the latest version of this app. You see your essential information immediately here. And you see that we have issues divided over multiple categories. We try to not give you just an endless list you can't come over. We try to categorize properly uh, into multiple severities. We try to make a difference between what is your code and what are your dependencies, because handling dependencies is usually done in a fundamentally different way than improving um, your own code. Um, so you can see we have five high severity issues in this case. And there's a couple of different OWASP um, violations, which are referred to by their OWASP um, reference points. Um, you can see a division of the issues and you have a full list. So for instance, in this app, there's an issue with SSL pinning. And if you um, open the, uh, the specific finding, you can see here the explanation of what is going wrong, some information about it, we even have a video explaining you why, why it's an issue and how you should think about it. Um, the reference to the OWASP guides and, and why you are making a mistake. And even a reference in your own code um, where the issue is. So in this case, it's just an empty method. Um, and we have actionable recommendations because there's nothing worse than knowing you have a security flaw and not knowing how to fix it. So we really try to be actionable. There should be a resolution for every issue that we found. Um, you should be able to fix your problems. We also provide some exter external links from further reading and more, in, um, more information about uh, the current issues. So this is a nutshell. In a nutshell, what is in AppSweep, but please do try it for yourself. And AppSweep will still change over time because AppSweep is a pretty young product. We released the first version about a year and a half ago, and we're definitely not done developing this. So there's more extensive findings coming all the time. It's always on top of our list because this 732 pages has not been all translated in, into automatic findings yet. So we're hard at work to improve the situation there. But it doesn't stop there. Um, we're missing dynamic analysis as a whole, so we're hard at work to make also dynamic analysis a part of AppSweep. Um, less relevant for this audience, but still, iOS support is also in the pipeline. But most import importantly, um, we're heading towards your needs. So I would love all of your feedback whenever um, you try it. There's this button at the bottom right of AppSweep where you can find a chat window and you can send us messages. We're not an AI company, so there's no chatbots involved. We're real people on the other side and we want to hear about your experience with AppSweep because it's really all about you. And what that means depends a bit on who you are. If you work on OWASP, we really want to help OWASP be successful as well. So we are also submitting new findings to OWASP um, whenever we see that some, something is missing. If you're an app developer, if you take the effort of trying us, if we develop new findings and we see new critical issues, we build a responsible disclosure to you as well. And um, for instance, in one case, we um, found 11 apps with uh, fully unprotected backends, which is a thing you don't want to have. Um, if I can just dump your uh, database. So um, it was, we developed it for a new feature. We immediately uh, took action on some apps we um, had uh, lying around because they tried apps before. Um, we also love the open source com community. So um, AppSweep itself is not open source, but the core behind AppSweep is. And it's actually the same core as the one of ProGuard. 
And so we're adding to that as well. It's your GitHub, please have a look. We're always excited to see what people can come up with. So we're using open source, but we're also providing open source. Um, if you're interested in what we do, please come and join us, because we're always on the lookout for um, people who want to help us make our dreams come true and make this uh, go faster and implement more. We have offices in Belgium and Germany, but we can help you with relocating. Um, but most of all, if you do one thing, please just try it and give us feedback. It's 100% free, you have nothing to lose, so um, please try it, and I'm very eager to hear what all of you are thinking about this. Um, my email address is at the bottom of the slide, so if you have any questions you want to ask me specifically, feel free to contact me at any point in time. And with that, I conclude my explanation, and I'm very open to answering some questions. Uh, that was a really nice talk. Uh, I didn't know a lot of these things about security on mobile, and I found the part about intents very interesting. Um, like, because usually I just take out strings from intents. I don't really think that much about it, but seeing the possibilities that can happen with intents, like I personally try to be more careful when using them. Uh, we do have one question. Okay, yeah. Um, so, um... MobSF and AppSweep are both free uh, tools for um, scanning your app. Um, in our opinion, uh, MobSF is um, good at finding issues, but it's not good at categorizing them and making them easy to interpret and actionable. So, and we, we really try in AppSweep to make our, the issues and the findings easy to understand, easy to take action on, and not just an endless list of things you cannot get through. So uh, we try to differentiate ourselves by being an actionable uh, piece of software. Mm, yeah, that was the only question we had. So uh, thank you so much uh, for presenting this talk. You're welcome. Uh, and to everyone else, uh, please stick around. We have another interesting talk coming up on building feature-rich apps using AWS. So that will start in about half an hour. Oh, we do have one more question if you have the time. I'll just yes. put it up on the screen. Um, can we run apps locally? Can you guys keep record of APKs? How is privacy handled? Um, so you can um, you cannot run AppSweep locally. So uh, it's a software as a service um, thing. Um, I would need to look up if we keep record. Um, in any case, most of what you will scan should be production ready apps you would otherwise upload to uh, the Play Store. So you just upload your final artifact. So um, there should be no real risk in you uploading it because the, you're not uploading any sensitive information. Um, I, I can get back to you if you want uh, on our exact uh, privacy um, policy of using AppSuite. Yeah. Uh Thanks for answering the question. All right. Thank you all for attending and uh, hope to see you again sometime soon.